Hello, everyone. Welcome to our last session for today, Introduction to Flare and Relief System Design with Engineer Wael Bakr. Engineer Wael Bakr is a process engineering consultant and technical authority with 23 years of broad experience in the oil and gas industry, from design to commissioning, in addition to considerable experience in offshore and onshore operations, as well as technical support and brownfield modifications. Wael is a chartered engineer and member of the Institution of Chemical Engineers in the UK and holding a master degree in chemical engineering and petroleum refining. Well has taken different work assignments across the globe with oil and gas super majors such as ENI, BP, Shell and Saudi Aramco. Welcome engineer Well, and uh, we can't wait to uh, hear from you uh, and from your great experience in our industry. Thanks, Reem, for the great uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm happy today to join um, the Arab Oil and Gas Academy and to participate with this uh, uh, presentation and webinar about the flare and the relief system. Uh, flare and the relief system uh, course uh, is about 40 hours, but I'm, I tried my best to uh, make it short and uh, highlight only the principles that are required to be understood and known for, uh, for anyone about the FLIR system. So uh, <clears throat> starting uh, about the webinar contents, today we will talk about why relief system is so important, uh, what are relief systems for, and uh, what is the causes uh, of the relief event to happen? And uh, for any standard system, what are the components of the relief system? What are the codes and the standards that relief system should be designed for and uh, uh, built? Uh, also, we will talk briefly about the steps we need to take as uh, if you are uh, a design, a process design engineers, or if you are a, a, a project engineer working on a project that uh, contains a relief system design, or even if you are a, an operation representative or engineering support engineer, uh, and part of your role is to review, um, uh, verify that uh, the proposed design for relief system is accurate and up to the standard or up to the uh, company uh, recommended practice. Or if you are part of uh, a third party uh, that was requested to do a verification on a flare uh, study or a flare design to ensure that it is capable of handling whatever it is the worst case scenario of relief and uh, blowdown. And we will give you a hint about the relief uh, valve uh, types and calculations. So starting uh, from the, the main question, why relief system is important? Uh, if you look at the UK HSE reports, uh, it will give you uh, very important statistics, which shows that uh, the reported incidents uh, have about 39% failure uh, of the equipment to provide relief when it is required. Uh, or you have the relief valve, but it is not correctly set. Uh, so the set pressure where the relief valve has to open is not correct. Or uh, the relief valve uh, uh, is blocked which can happen because of uh, different reasons. Uh, some of these reasons are related to the fouling uh, of uh, the services or the fluid that will be handled, uh, or um, uh, operator error to isolate downstream or up upstream the relief valve, which may happen. Uh, also, uh, the design itself could be wrong and uh, the capacity sometimes is not adequate. So you will have 
the relief valve installed, but its capacity is not sufficient or adequate to cope with the reliefing scenario. Uh, why relief system is important? If you look at the incidents uh, that happen in the industry, not only in the oil and gas, but in all petrochemical industry, pharmaceutical, or food, any industry in the world, uh, even in your home, if uh, the water uh, boiler or heater is, uh, is not working properly and uh, your uh, relief valve or safety relief valve is defected, uh, you may have a, a, a catastrophic failure and incident in your home because of this. So uh, looking at examples of catastrophic failures like uh, Grange mouth uh, incidents, uh, we have, as you can see, complete destruction of the uh, equipments uh, because of the uh, overpressure scenario. So in this case, we have uh, a low pressure separator. Uh, unfortunately, the low pressure separator has been provided with a, a pressure relief valve, but it was undersized. So whenever the relief valve was required to overcome an overpressure scenario, it, it wasn't able to do it. So uh, an overpressure happened, leading to uh, a catastrophic gas leak, subsequent fire and explosion that took over about six hours. And uh, the ultimate uh, consequences of that, that LB separator uh, uh, failed and uh, the, the materials of the LB separator, the metals, has been scattered over a distance of one kilometer. So imagine the consequences of that. It is not only on the plant itself, not only on the uh, operators in the plant, but also on the community surrounding the, uh, the plant. This is another example from Krishba uh, plant where uh, the relief valve was sized properly. However, the tail pipe, which is the downstream uh, pipe that will transfer uh, the relief gas to the main header of the, of the relief system was undersized. And because of that, there was a fatigue due to vibration and uh, uh, it results into a, a, a failure of welded T and the major gas release. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was no fire or explosion, so the situation was uh, covered. So uh, what is the pressure uh, relief system? Uh, pressure relief system, as you can see here uh, as an example, this is a vessel where you have liquid, you have gas, you have multiple feeds, and you have outlet gas, outlet liquid. You may have some sort of heating from a steam or heating medium like uh, uh, heating medium uh, oil. And due to many reasons, you may exceed the design pressure of that vessel. And this is the reason why you need a relief valve. So relief valve, is, to is a protection of, uh, of plant from overpressure by discharging part of uh, the contents or all of the contents when the pressure rises sufficiently to what we call it as uh, acid pressure. Uh, not only exceeding the pressure, but sometimes you can go on the opposite direction. So you may go to vacuum due to many other reasons, so due to vacuum, uh, the surrounding pressure, which is the atmospheric pressure, will be higher than the pressure inside the vessel. And for that reason, the vessel will collapse. So why we need the relief system? Why it is provided? So any process in this world is not always uh, operating as intended. So continuously, there is a lot of variations, upset, changes, 
and uh, events that will uh, be different from the normal operating targets you need. And because of that, uh, your equipment uh, pressure could be exceeded over than the safe values. Uh, and because of that, the, if the pressure exceeded that safe values, or for example, the design pressure of the vessel, the vessel could fail and burst. And uh, because of that, you will have uncontrolled release of uh, energy. In, in this case, you will have uncontrolled release of toxic gases or uh, uh, flammable gases. And uh, with uh, uh, availability of a source of ignition, you will have fire or explosion. That will have direct impact to personnel. Uh, so you can have injuries, serious injuries, or even fatalities. You can have a catastrophic damage to the equipment or impact uh, to the environment. Um, unfortunately, uh, not always uh, you can design your plan to withstand whatever it is, the maximum pressure that will be flowing to due to many reasons. And for that reason, you have to provide your plant with this uh, overpressure protection. So what kind of events that could happen and lead to overpressure? Uh, on top of this is the external fire. So your equipment's running normally. There is no problems. Uh, but you have a small leakage from the equipment, from the piping associated to the equipment. Uh, and this leakage will accumulate under the vessel. And uh, normally we have a drainage system to get rid of this. However, that drainage system could be blocked or could be insufficient. So the accumulated liquid, whenever... Uh, it, it gets or it faces any source of ignition, an external fire, which we call it pool fire, will happen. Uh, you can have equipment failures. There is many associated equipments in, the, in, in, in any plant. The probability of failure for any of these equipments uh, is, is high. And uh, failure of, of equipment could lead to an upset, and that upset could lead to an overpressure. Uh, one of the most uh, unwanted events, and uh, although we have an intensive training, two operators, but you have operator errors. Uh, so you need intensive training, you need operating procedures, you need work permit system, to avoid this kind of things. Uh, operator errors could, be, could lead to a catastrophic incident because uh, it could not lead to uh, upsets only, but it could lead to uh, isolate the protection system, which happened many times in the industry and led to uh, fatalities. Uh, you can have also an instrument or control system failure you may have a valve failure, so you have a lot of uh, uh, control valves everywhere, level control valves, pressure control valves, uh, flow control valves. These valves will fail. And whenever it fails, it will lead to uh, a scenario where uh, the overpressure could be developed. Also utility, you have a lot of utilities in your plant. You have an instrument air, you have cooling water, you have nitrogen, any loss of, uh, uh, of these utilities could lead to uh, uh, an overpressure scenario. Also, we have thermal expansion. Thermal expansion could happen in the plant due to many reasons. Thermal expansion could be happen due, due to isolating uh, a, a liquid-filled pipe or a liquid-filled vessel uh, for a prolonged time. And uh, because of the changes in the ambient condition, it could be exposed to sunlight, and because of that heating, uh, the pressure inside the vessel could increase 
and cause uh, uh, an overpressure. Not only that, but you could have a heating system connected to your equipment like a heating coil and during maintenance you can isolate your uh, uh, equipment inlet and out but you forget to isolate the heating medium so that heating medium will continue to supply heat and cause uh, uh, a thermal expansion also in chemical plants and petrochemical plants the reaction could be out of control and the good lead, if it is a, uh, an, uh, uh, an exothermal reaction, it could lead to a very high temperature and uh, subsequent high pressure. Uh, for a standard or a typical relief system, we have in our industry um, what we call it high pressure flare system and low pressure flare system. Uh, normally, you have in your process two, uh, two systems. Uh, high pressure system which exceed uh, 10 bar gauge and low pressure system which is less than the 10 bar gauge. And uh, you need to segregate between these two systems in the relief system because if you connect both together, you may have a back pressure from the high pressure system to the low pressure system. So normally we have a dedicated low pressure flare system, a dedicated high pressure flare system. So for example, what are the components of the, uh, the flare system? So first of all, you have to have uh, 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 an over pressure protection devices like a, a pressure safety valve. You have to have an emergency uh, blowdown valves and this emergency blowdown valves are provided sometimes for uh, vessels which have uh, a pressure higher than 250 psi as per the code requirement and whenever the relief system may not be sufficient in case of emergency like fire you may need to decrease the, the, sub, the consequences of the fire by doing a total shutdown and depressurization of the inventory of the equipment or the gas inside your equipment to the flare system to minimize the impact of the fire. Because whenever you have fire, the vessel uh, wall will be uh, subject to very high heat and it will lose integrity and may fail. So it's better that you depressurize the, uh, the content on, or the inventory safely to the flare system to minimize the impact if the uh, fire became uncontrolled. Also, uh, other types of relief system is called the rupture disc. A rupture disc, it is, uh, an, it's a metal disc that can withstand up to a certain pressure and at that certain pressure, it will open to release the liquid to the flare system. And all of these uh, uh, sources has to be commingled together in a main flare header. That main flare header has to be sized properly to, uh, uh, to take whatever it is, the highest relief rate without any issues of back pressure on your equipment or uh, high speed or high velocities that will lead to vibration. And uh, the ultimate destination of that uh, flare header has to go through a flare knockout drum. Why we need a flare knockout drum? Because end of the day, you have not only gases going to the flare, but you have liquids. These liquids could be normal liquids from a source of liquid, could be a liquid uh, 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 formed due to expansion and Joel Thompson effect. So because you are releasing gas from high pressure system to a flare pressure, which is normally less than 50 PSI. In normal condition, the pressure is about 5 PSI or less. But during reliefing condition, the pressure could go to uh, up to 40 or 50 PSI maximum. So what will happen due to that expansion? You will get condensation in the flare knockout drum. 
because you get a con because you get a condensation, you need to get rid of this condensation to a safe place. So you need a pump to pump out that liquids. Why we need that to protect the flare stack from burning two phase uh, uh, gas and liquid, which is very very difficult to be done. And at the same time, as you know, burning gas is almost ideal, so the emission to uh, environments will be okay, should be okay. However, if you have uh, a release of liquid, the ignition of that liquid will not be completely happen, so you will dispose uh, uh, carbon monoxide and other, uh, other uh, things. However, uh, also one of the big issues is to send burning liquids because you you may not be able to burn all the liquids and that liquids will go and spread around the flare area and causing fire everywhere uh, the last uh, bit is the flare stack itself there is a lot of uh, uh, flare stack design uh, depend on the the amount, the, the fluid that you need to bear. Uh, the height of that stack is dependent on the radiation uh, that will be emitted from the, the burned gas. So the more radiation you need to make your stack longer in order to maintain the radiation level on the ground of your plant and around a certain area, which we call it sterile zone, has to be within uh, uh, an acceptable limit, which is normally 3.6 kilowatt per uh, standard cubic meter. So also you need to have an igniter. So that igniter, whenever you have uh, a gas, that igniter will ignite the gas. Normally we have uh, a, permanent, a permanently lit pilots. So that pilots is, uh, uh, is letting all the time in order to burn any gases whenever it is released to the flame. In case that pilots failed for any reason, due to high wind or adverse weather condition or any blockage, you have an ignition system that will let it again. I forget to tell you that uh, you need a burge gas because end of the day, that header is sized for a huge amount of gas. So during normal operation, the amount of gas going to that uh, flare header is very small. So uh, that small gas could uh, lead to problems. So you need to have a Berge gas to maintain a certain exit velocity from the tip to maintain sweep of uh, any liquids inside the header to the flare knockout drum and also to prevent air ingress from the atmosphere to the stack uh, and make sure that inside the flare header there is no explosive mixture. We need to know also what are the design codes and the standards. Why? Because end of the day, Due to these uh, catastrophic incidents, industry experts and uh, subject matter experts from all major companies have uh, get together and, uh, and presented issues and proposed solutions. And uh, from industry experience, they have provided ways uh, and the procedures to design, uh, uh, test, install, operate, these uh, equipments properly. So uh, for your information, all the flare system has to be designed to cope with and comply with the minimum requirement of these standards like ASME, like API uh, uh, standards. So for example, API standard 520, this is for sizing, selection, installation of pre pressure relief valves. Also, API 520, uh, this is for pressure reliefing and the pressurization system. So it tells you how to assess your system, how to identify the reliefing loads in order to size your relief system properly. 
So we need to talk about uh, how to uh, design the relief system in a very uh, small steps, very easy steps that will enable you to do it properly and will avoid forgetting any uh, major requirements. So first of all, you need to know your system. What are the equipments or systems or vessels that need to be protected? So what you do is you identify the boundaries of, uh, of any vessel or any equipment from other equipments in order to focus on these equipment and try to define the other steps required to estimate the relief. Then you need to know about that system, what is the maximum and the minimum pressure permitted during relief condition. So by knowing the maximum pressure of your vessel, you can avoid over or exceeding the pressure of uh, the vessel and catastrophic failure of the vessel. By knowing the minimum pressure, you will avoid vacuum and collapse of your vessel. Then you will identify the potential causes. What could go wrong to lead to an overpressure scenario that will require release or vent of that gas to a flare system? Overpressure scenario or underpressure scenario? An advantage uh, uh, during the design uh, you could utilize by thinking out of the box. So what we call it now is inherently safer design. So after you review your design, you have to look at ways to eliminate sources or causes of overpressure or underpressure. If you are not able to do that, you may able to at least reduce the relief demand itself, which will have a great impact on your facility safety and a great impact on your project cost. Once this is concluded, you have to calculate the required relief load because you may have uh, many scenarios or uh, multiple scenarios that will involve some other sources and you have to add up all of these to know the maximum coincident uh, uh, relieving load. Then uh, you are able now to size your relief uh, device. After that, you have to size properly the inlet uh, piping of your relief device because if you don't size it properly, it may restrict the flow. Same for the outlet header, the collection header that has to be designed to handle all the relief rates from all the, the, the systems connected to it. Uh, providing that you meet the, uh, uh, the criteria, which is two major things you have to consider in a relief header. That you have to meet a certain uh, MAC number and you have to meet a certain back pressure. If you exceed those, you will face big problems. You may not be able to relieve the required relieving load or even you may lead to catastrophic failure of your relief. And you have to be very careful about the disposal route because if you connect two incompatible fluids to a same header, you may have blockage. You may have back pressure, you may have issues. So if we start by selecting how to select the equipment, this is an example. We have a vessel. That vessel have two phase, uh, gas and liquid. That vessel is fed from many sources. Could be fuel gas to have a blanket. Could be a major feed that could be natural or through a pump. That vessel is uh, feeding another 
vessel or another equipment uh, from the uh, liquid outlet. You have bump, you have level control system. You have also outlet vapor uh, that is controlled by a pressure control valve. You have a heating medium like steam and the temperature of the vessel is controlled by temperature control valve. So the vessel itself have a lot of streams, inlet and outlet. You have to identify all the streams connected to the vessel. That will affect, by many reasons, the pressure of the vessels. So you can see here, the vessel operating pressure is 2 bar gauge. However, you are feeding it from a source of 7 bar gauge, and this differential is controlled by this control valve. Also, the steam provided have a source of pressure of 6 bar gauge. So you have to be very careful because end of the day, normal operating pressure is 2 bar gauge, but the design pressure is 3.5 bar gauge. So you have to uh, avoid exceeding that design pressure as otherwise your vessel will be failed. So, if we look at the vessel, we will have a lot of sources of energy that may impact the vessel integrity. So, we when we uh, draw our boundaries around any system or equipment, we have to include all the sources affecting the uh, uh, operation of that vessel. Then we have to define the maximum minimum pressure as we said uh, to understand what is the maximum pressure we need to understand and know a certain terminologies so starting from what is the operating pressure operating pressure is the maximum steady pressure at which the process or vessel could operate continuously so when you design your plant you need to define the normal operating pressure where your equipment or vessel shall operate most of the time, 95% of your time. You select that pressure based on the optimum condition you get from at your target. For example, if you have a reaction at a certain pressure, that reaction will give you the, uh, the outcome you need. For a separation at a certain pressure, the separation is the optimum. So you define the operating pressure based on the target you need. Once you define the operating pressure, you need to know what is the design pressure you, you will design your vessel for. As you know, design pressure has to be higher than operating pressure. How higher than the design pressure should be? First of all, you have to consider that uh, or know what is the most severe pressure uh, or condition at coincident temperature that you could face. And once you know that, you know exactly how could be the design pressure. Uh, as a rule of thumb, when, whenever you choose the operating pressure, you put above that value 5%. 5% above that value will give you the maximum operating pressure. So whenever you have an upset, your maximum operating pressure will be about 5% above the operating pressure. Over the maximum operating pressure, we put a 10% margin to define the design pressure. So we have enough margin in case anything happened or any upset happened, you have a margin that you can take uh, uh, a proper action to prevent exceeding the, uh, the design pressure. And you, you can, uh, uh, you may know or you may heard about the maximum allowable working pressure and what is the relationship of the maximum allowable work, working pressure and the design pressure. Whenever you decide the design pressure, you will tell the mechanical engineer uh, to design the mechanical aspect of the vessel, which is how the vessel sickness should be. 
whenever this is defined, there is a lot of margins added to it in addition to corrosion, allowance, or whatever it is. So the required thickness will be higher than the required thickness for the required design pressure. So actually, your vessel can withstand the pressure higher than the required design pressure, which we call it maximum allowable working pressure. So maximum allowable working pressure could be equal or could be higher than design pressure. So the set pressure, set pressure, this is the, the set point where you adjust your relief device to open in case it reaches. Normally we set the set pressure at the design pressure. What is overpressure? Overpressure, this is by the code, the allowable uh, extra pressure above the set point that your relieving device can uh, uh, operate under it uh, in order to achieve the rated flow. Yani for example, I set a pressure at 100 bar gauge and I have uh, a single relief valve. Uh, provided to that vessel. By code requirement or code uh, 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 principles, you can go up to 10% uh, above. So the relieving pressure could be 110 of the set pressure. If you have multiple relief valves, your multiple relief valves, let's say the second or third relief valves, could go to an overpressure of 115%, 115%, 115%. And you size the relief valve for, for that uh, value. Under fire condition, you could go to 121%. So over pressure will be 21% over the set pressure during fire condition only. Uh, the pressure increase above the maximum allowable working pressure, allowing the discharge, which, which we call it uh, before, is called the accumulation. And the relieving pressure for that reason will be the maximum allowable working pressure plus that accumulation. Let's look at how to identify relieving scenarios. So that vessel which we were talking about, we will look at all possible uh, overpressure scenarios that will require uh, that relief valve to be sized for. So as per uh, API 521, you have uh, a list of proposed scenarios that you need to investigate and assess that your equipment could be subjected to. And for that reason, you, you will be able to identify the relieving loads associated with this uh, relieving scenario. First relieving scenario we uh, assess is called uh, blocked outlet or closed outlet. So that vessel have a lot of valves or equipments around it. So if we call, if we look at the closed outlets, let's start from the vapor outlet. You have PCV-2. Uh, this is the outlet pressure controller that will try to maintain the pressure inside the vessel at two bar gauge. In case the pressure go lower, that PCV will sense from that uh, PIC or pressure indicator controller that the pressure is going down and for that reason the pressure controller will send a signal to the pressure control valve to close a little bit to maintain the pressure around two bar. On the opposite way if for any reason you have more flow coming the pressure will start to rise. For that reason, the pressure in, in, uh, indicator controller will sense that you have a higher pressure than the set point, which is two bar, and will send a signal to the pressure control valve to open more 
to release more flow to maintain the material balance around the uh, vessel. So end of the day, we need to have whatever is feeding the vessel is equivalent to the outlet of the vessel. So that PCV-2 could fail in closed position. Whenever it fails in closed position, the pressure inside here will rise very fast. Also, you have what we call it a, a manual valve. That manual valve is not like the control valve opening and, and closing automatically based on a control signal, but that manual valve is intended to be opened or closed by the operator. And in, during normal operation, it has to be open. We close it whenever we need to do a preparation for shutdown by uh, stopping the, the, the plant. So we stop the plant, isolate the vessel, depressurize the vessel to do maintenance or, or whatever it is. So by, uh, by error, operator could close that valve and whenever it closes, nothing is going out, so the pressure will start to rise. What else? On the liquid outlet, we have also an isolation valve for that pump. Also, that level control valve on the pump discharge is controlling that level to maintain the level around a certain set point, let's say 30% or 50% of the vessel uh, height, that level control will open or close <coughs> in order to control the outlet flow from the vessel to maintain the level. If the level control valve LCV-1 failed in closed position, no liquid will go out and you will start to build up liquid inside the vessel till you may reach to an overfilling scenario. What is the issue of the overfilling scenario? Once you build up liquid to overfilling, there is no space to get the inflow. And subsequent overpressure will happen in very few time. So these are uh, possible causes of closed or blocked outlets on the vessel, which will lead to overpressure scenario. Other possible scenarios will be overfilling. Okay, so you have a feed bump. That feed bump could exceed the, uh, uh, the maximum flow that uh, normally fed to that vessel. So it may lead to an overpressure. So uh, you have also, as we said, those uh, valves could be closed or even the bump could fail and stop. So liquid is going inside and feeding the vessel while the outlet liquid is not handled. We have also failure of automatic controllers. So we have many automatic controllers here. If we have a failure open of PCV-1, which is the feed valve, this will lead to more flow. If we have failure close of PCV-2, this will lead to high pressure inside because the outlet gas is not handled. If we have a fail open of temperature control valve, TCV-1, you will get more steam and more heating, which will generate more vapor. If you have fail close of LCV, as we said, you will have overfilling and over. As we said, the abnormal heating that could happen during, due to uh, failure of the temperature control valve 
or even if your feed composition it changes and uh, if you have a reaction inside your reaction will be different and uh, generated pressure and generated heat could be completely different that w that could be above your normal uh, operating uh, regime and uh, as we said the external fire so we, 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 we discussed together about the leakage from vessel or associated piping or systems uh, under the vessel. And the accumulated liquid will form a pool fire whenever it, it, it gets uh, a, a source of ignition. That external heat will supply a huge amount of heat to the vessel wall. Once it heats the vessel wall, the inlet liquid will start to boil and generate vapor where the pressure subsequently will increase beyond maybe the outlet control valve that is handling the vapor outlet. And for that reason, you will get an overpressure scenario. Uh, as we were talking about the vacuum, many reasons could be uh, for the vacuum. You may have uh, outlet valve fail open, uh, so it will empty your vessel uh, pressure uh, while uh, you are getting uh, or, or, uh, or pumping out a lot of liquid from the vessel. So the pressure will go down till it may reach to vacuum condition. You may also under uh, shutdown, so it's not the, the plant is not operating. You have isolated your vessel in and out, and you start to drain the vessel, but you forgot to open the vent. So you drain, and there is nothing compensating that uh, liquid going out. So the pressure will drop and may reach to vacuum condition where. If your vessel is not designed for vacuum condition, it may collapse. And this happened a lot with uh, maintenance for uh, storage tanks, where they have forgot the vent valve uh, closed, or intentionally it was closed for uh, a maintenance activity, and it was not returned back, while they have filled the, the, the tank with water, to do a hydro test uh, after the repair to make sure that the tank is, uh, is able to hold uh, the level inside. Then they drain the water to get rid of the uh, hydraulic uh, test water in order to fill the, the, the tank with hydrocarbon, but they forget the vent. So they drain the liquid, the water, the hydro test water, the pressure goes down till the atmospheric, uh, till the pressure, uh, the tank pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure, and the tank collapses. So, we have uh, gone through the, the the cases, the scenarios, and now it is time to uh, know how to calculate the relief rate. So we have to look at worst credible scenarios. You shouldn't only look at the normal operating cases. You have to look at all scenarios where deviations or upsets, even during startup or shutdown of the facility, that normal, uh, that the flow of, uh, of, uh, of the equipment could exceed the uh, normal operating condition or the pressure could exceed or be lower than the normal operating pressure. And we have to identify the, the fluid sources uh, pressure, as we have explained, and also the temperatures or any heat input. And we need to look also at the restrictions or the rate controlling the items, because, for example, you have valves, you have orifices, you have pumps. End of the day, you cannot get more than, or you cannot get out more than of these restrictions. So to have a credible scenario, you need to look at 
what is the restrictions or controlling, great controlling items around your process. You need to calculate the volumetric flow rates for the fluid sources, inlet and outlet, at relieving condition. Because end of the day, you have to look at rate at relieving condition, because rate at relieving condition will be different than rate at operating condition. Then you calculate the net volume, which will be used to design your system. This is in, in, in normal or general uh, uh, definition of the flow. There is a special cases like the external fire relief rate. How to define the external relief fire rate. It is not like what we called about inlet flow and outlet flow, but this is external effect due to fire where that heat input will vaporize the liquid inside and it will generate vapor. So we need to know how much the relieving rate due to that fire. As a simple equation, the relieving rate, the mass flow rate, will be equivalent to the heat input divided by the latent heat of vaporization. That heat input, how to estimate the heat input? There is many factors affecting that heat inputs. First of all, the area uh, uh, subjected to the fire, which we call it wetted surface area. So wetted surface area, the, the area of the vessel that is covered by the liquid and uh, subjected to the, the fire. Uh, and we will talk about how to calculate that area. Also, uh, there is some constants uh, which is uh, depending on um, um, the, 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 the standard uh, units, whether it is SI units or uh, USC units. Uh, the environmental factors, which is the, uh, to take credit for insulation or not. So you may have that vessel is insulated, uh, fire insulation. So that fire insulation will decrease the heat input to the vessel. Comparing to a bare vessel, uh, uh, so we have two equations. One equation is used for uh, whenever you have an adequate drainage and firefighting system. The other one, when you have inadequate drainage and fire system. For, ex for example, if you have an adequate drainage, that adequate drainage will ensure that whenever any liquid will be accumulated, it will be continuously drained. This will help to minimize the impact of the, of the bull fire. As we said, the F factor, which is the environmental factor, is one, so it has no change for bare vessel. However, for fire insulated vessel is about, about 0.3. So imagine the rate of the uh, relief is 30% for insulated vessel comparing to a bare vessel. Uh, as we said, this is a wetted area which is exposed to the fire and contacted with liquid. Normally, we ignore the bottom of the vessel because it is covered by what we call it skirt, which is the metal st structure supporting the vessel to the ground. Or sometimes it is uh, supported and part of it is covered under the ground. So we exclude this uh, part because it will not be subjected to uh, direct fire. In uh, other practices uh, or most of the engineering company will add percentage to that equivalent to the attached piping because the attached piping, for example, outlet piping will contain liquid 
And once you heat the liquid inside the vessel, that content of liquid will be heated also and will be subjected to fire. So and normally they take 10 to 20% of the uh, weighted area volume uh, or the vessel volume uh, as a total uh, volume. So the vessel weighted area in addition to 10 to 20% of, of it to uh, cope for or to cover the associated pipe. Uh, as per the standards, uh, because the flame cannot go over than this, you uh, uh, consider only 7.6 meter or 25 meter uh, of the uh, vessel height. If you have a vessel that is on uh, an elevation higher than 7.6 meter or 25 feet, you exclude the pool fire scenario. So pool fire is not a credible scenario. If the vessel location above a break or above an elevated uh, position that is above the 25 feet. What are, what is the liquid uh, level? I have to assume that my vessel will be having during fire. There is a lot of industry practice talking about the normal liquid level. Uh, sometimes they said high, high liquid level, but in normal uh, or in general, we use the uh, level alarm high. So if you look at your vessel, you have a normal operating level, let's say 50%. You allow that level to increase up to 60% where you have an alarm high activated to announce or give an op the operator uh, 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 attention that you have a problem, you need to take an action. And uh, then you have another level of high level, which we call it high high or a trip or shutdown, where you need to stop the process and isolate the vessel to prevent uh, overfilling and overpressure, subsequent overpressure. So normally we take the high level alarm as uh, the level to calculate the weighted area. The latent, the latent heat has to be at the relieving condition. Uh, in many cases in our hydrocarbon industry, we don't have a single component. We have a multiple components. So you have to estimate the latent heat. So what will be the latent heat uh, of vaporization? So uh, as per our industry practice, we take the fraction of that mixture uh, that, will, that will be vaporized uh, uh, by, uh, by 5%. So the first 5% mass that will be vaporized uh, we calculate the latent heat of it. Uh, under certain conditions for certain fluids, at relieving condition, the fluid could not be vaporized. It could be under supercritical condition. So under supercritical condition, uh, it's still something that is not uh, vapor still something like liquid. So it, 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 the latent heat of vaporization is zero. So you have to estimate the volumetric expansion due to uh, uh, heat. This is for the fire. Uh, to calculate uh, for other scenarios, which is, for example, failure of control valve. So as we saw, before we have the vessel supplied by a uh, fuel gas. The vessel pressure is two bar. The design pressure is 3.5, while the upstream pressure is seven bar. If that pressure control valve fail for any reason, the differential pressure across that valve will uh, lead to a flow higher than the normal flow. For example, if I'm feeding 10 million standard cubic feet per day under normal condition, and the differential pressure is about seven bar to two bar, 
then if that valve fail the flow uh, uh, instantaneous flow will be huge and it will be higher as much as the upstream pressure is high if we look at this is a, a, a valtec one of the vendors um, uh, it's a property uh, uh, proprietary uh, uh, sizing equation you will you will be able to estimate the mass flow rate that will go through that valve and mass flow rate that mass flow rate will be the relieving rate or you have to size your relief valve to relieve that rate how to estimate it you need to know the characteristic of that valve which we call it the capacity coefficient or cv of that valve at full open so if it is normally uh, at 20% open and the CV is 20, you have to know how much the CV at 100%. It could be huge. And for that reason, the, uh, the flow will be huge. Also, you need to know the upstream pressure. You need to know the molecular weight of the gas, the compressibility of the gas, and at what condition that gas. Once you calculate that amount, you will be able to know how the, uh, the, the size of your relief valve should be. You have to, to take in your consideration many things. First of all, as we said, a full open CV. Don't take consideration to, uh, to, uh, to, to have a, a valve failure on a certain position, no assume that it will fail at 100%. This is the most conservative approach. Uh, don't assume that uh, the trip system or the shutdown system will work. So for, 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 for example, in normal uh, uh, plant, you will have a high pressure protection device, like a switch, which will trigger a plant shutdown and will isolate inlet and outlet of the uh, vessel once the pressure is reached. And we normally set that pressure below the maximum uh, allowable working pressure or below the design pressure of the vessel. If our design pressure is 3.5, we will add a pressure switch high at 3 or less. Something in between the normal operating pressure and the design pressure. So don't consider that the uh, shutdown system will work and they prevent that scenario from happening. Don't take credit for outflow. Yani we have outlet flow from the vessel. So somebody could say, okay, uh, during failure of that valve, I will get 50 million standard cubic feet per day. But normally I have 10 million outflow from the vessel so the ex the, uh, the the ex the additional flow is about 40 50 minus 10. no we don't do that we don't take credit for the outlet flow what is uh, the high pressure should be normally that pressure is seven bar but it could be higher so I have to look at the most higher pressure here. Normally, we look at the trip condition here to know what is the high, high pressure trip here. For example, if the normal operating pressure is seven bar, however, trip pressure is 10 bar, we assume that upstream pressure is 10 bar. If I don't know the upstream a trip pressure or if I don't have a trip pressure, I look at the relieving condition upstream. So if I have a relief valve here, what is the, set, what is the relief uh, pressure of that valve? Other scenarios that we need to uh, assess uh, the flow uh, under this condition, with, which is a, a common upset condition related to reverse flow. Yani for example, I have a compression, a compressor system. 
Normally, I have a suction pressure, which is low. Let's say 10 bar gauge. I have a discharge pressure, could be 50 bar gauge. So, so that compre compressor uh, function is to post the pressure from 10 to 50. If you have a trip, sudden trip, that downstream system could be a huge system, could be a vessel, surge drum, could be a huge pipeline. So it is under a high pressure, which is 50. While when this trip, it will be here, the, yani something uh, uh, near to the suction pressure. We call it sometimes uh, settle out pressure, where uh, the pressure is equalized between this section and this section. But let's say it, it is a suction pressure. So due to that reason, we have 50 bar gauge here. We have 10 bar gauge here. So flow will reverse back from outlet to inlet. And due to that reverse flow, the suction system may not be able or may not be designed to withstand that pressure. And for that reason, it will be subjected to overpressure scenario and you could have failure or rupture. So as per the standard design, we provide something called NRV, non-return valve or check valve. So how to take a credit for a check valve? Will the check valve adequate to prevent reverse flow? Especially if we have a scenario of overpressure due to low rating pressure on suction system. As per industry practice, if you have a single non-return valve or check valve, we don't take credit for it. So what happened? You have to size the relief system in this equipment to release or relieve the calculated re reverse flow through the full uh, section area of uh, that uh, relief valve. For example, that, uh, so, sorry, check valve. That, that check valve is 10 inch. So you look at, or you estimate how much flow from high pressure, which is 50, to low pressure, which is 10, through that 10, 10 inch uh, size uh, check valve. But if you have, double check valve, and uh, it has to be dissimilar to avoid common uh, mode failure, we take credit for a check valve. So if we have double dissimilar check valve, we consider that the relief rate is only 10% of the flow through the largest check valve cross-sectional area. Uh, we will talk now, uh, now about the relieving rate due to thermal expansion. As we talked about it, we have cases where you have a blocked inventory of liquid inside pipe or inside the vessel, and it has to be fully filled with liquid. If you have a gas space, that gas space will help to release any overpressure because it is compressible. However, the problem with liquid is it is incompressible. So it cannot tolerate any increase in the pressure. The pressure increase will be uh, huge in no time. Look at this flange uh, on a pipe. It has been isolated with this spline, the flange. It was subjected to sun uh, heat uh, for uh, an extended period, uh, extended period meaning uh, the, the, the period between uh, the time where the sun sh shine to the sunset, which uh, could be uh, eight hours or whatever it is, or uh, sorry, 10 hours or 12 hours. So what will happen, uh, uh, as, uh, as I indicated here, small temperature rise can cause large pressure rise. For example, 
Sri Bargage, Sri Bargage, per degree C increase for water at 20 degree C. So you have, you can have three per gauge, which is 45 PSI increase for only one degree centigrade increase. Imagine how much temperature you can get from an isolated uh, liquid inventory. So imagine that the operation team isolated the inventory at early morning where the ambient temperature was too low. Let's say 10 degrees C. Then during uh, more, uh, uh, morning time, we have uh, uh, a thermal radiation from sun where the temperature rise to 40, 50, whatever it is. So imagine the overpressure that could be exposed to. Um, how to calculate uh, the, the thermal expansion and uh, the rate of relief that will be uh, uh, results uh, resulting from it. Uh, from industry practice, if uh, the relief valve that will be installed will have less than 1% uh, uh, flashing uh, across the relief valve, only we provide uh, a small relief valve uh, to that uh, uh, piping, which is uh, uh, half inch or three quarter inch. However, if the flashing is higher than that, you have to follow that equation to estimate the relief rate. Uh, as we said, we should look at possible ways to uh, get rid or eliminate the, the relief by modifying the design, or at least uh, decrease the relieving rate. So uh, what we call it inherently safer design, you may select to design the vessel for the maximum allowable working pressure of the upstream source of uh, flow. You uh, may elect to design the vessel for full vacuum, but this will require a big investment, but it will eliminate other investments because if you design for this uh, 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 full uh, rated uh, system, you will get rid of the requirement for the relief and the requirement for the relief will cost you a lot. Uh, not only a relief valve, but the associated system like the relief header, the, the huge relief header, the huge flare system, uh, uh, expense and capital cost is huge. In addition to the hazard itself. Uh, the failure mode itself of the control valve, you, you may select that failure mode of the control valve to be in a, a safe mode that will prevent uh, a certain scenarios from happening. Yani for example, outlet valve from a vessel, instead of selecting that valve to be failed in a closed position, and subsequently will lead to overpressure, you may select to uh, have that valve fail in open position. So you have eliminated the blocked outlet scenario. Uh, inlet valve, uh, when we discussed, we said inlet valve could fail in, in fail open and it will uh, supply the vessel with a huge amount of flow that may exceed the pressure and could lead to overpressure. You may select that the failure position of that control valve could be in a fail close. Uh, same uh, situation for to, to minimize the complete failure of many control valve system. Uh, so these control valves uh, working by an instrument tape. So you need to uh, supply uh, independent supply of instrument air uh, to uh, these valves, which you may assess and find that uh, multiple failure or common mode failure due to failure of an instrument air could lead to uh, a big reliefing load. So you may eliminate that big reliefing load by having a dedicated segregation or uh, a segregation 
uh, of the air supply and have a dedicated supply of air to uh, this uh, control system. Same as the power failure to eliminate common mode failure also. Uh, finally, I would like to, to talk with you about what is the relief valve itself. Uh, relief valve itself, it is uh, a valve uh, that is uh, 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 sized and built to release the excess gas at a, uh, at a certain set point to the, relief, uh, to the relief header or the flare header. As you can see here, this is the nozzle where, it is, where the relief valve is connected to the vessel. So uh, normally we have the vessel, and this vessel has an outlet nozzle dedicated to the relief valve. And at this nozzle, the relief valve will be installed. The relief valve have a body, and inside that body, we have a spring, okay? And that spring is adjusted at a certain load to give you a certain pressure setting. So, you have to, you have, to have the pressure here increased in order to reach to the set point where it will overcome that disk and push the whole assembly above to release the gas to the flare. And this is a simple photo for relief valves where it is installed. This is the flange, the nozzle, where it is installed on the vessel. The, the relief valve body. Here is the spring and the bonnet. And here it is the outlet vent. In this case, it is open to atmosphere. Now it's not permitted to release hydrocarbons to atmosphere. You have to have a closed uh, flare system, but you may have that one on uh, a non-hazard service like air system, uh, any kind of uh, other non-hazard system like nitrogen. What are the types of uh, relief valves? We have these main three types of relief valves. The one we explained to called conventional uh, relief valve or spring loaded, where we have a spring here with a, a certain adjustment to give a required force and pressure where uh, the, the, the set pressure, if it reaches, it will push the whole assembly and release to the flare. Balanced uh, bellows or balanced pressure relief valve, it has a, 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 a certain additional comp component uh, called the bellows. Why this bellows is provided? The problem here with conventional type, it has a limitation on the maximum back pressure. So maximum back pressure, because of you are releasing a lot of flow, that will build the up pressure on the relief system. That back pressure has to be maximum 10% of the set pressure. Otherwise, the capacity of that relief uh, valve will be impacted uh, considerably. And in order to minimize the back pressure, you have to have a bigger uh, flare header diameter, which means a considerable uh, capital cost. To overcome this issue and have uh, flexibility to increase the back pressure up to 40% of the set pressure, we have that balanced bellows arrangement. Pilot operated, this pilot operated uh, pressure safety valve can go up to 90% of the back pressure. Can go up to 90% back pressure of the set pressure. And it is normally used, as we said, at high back pressure, where we have a limitations on the flare header uh, system, for example, existing system, that will require a huge capital cost uh, in order to change the headers. Also for a huge amount of gas, uh, like on the compressor uh, discharges. How to size a relief valve? Very simple. The more effort 
as we explained on the uh, first part, which is assessment of the scenarios, which is a credible scenario, which are the coincident uh, relieving loads. And if you reach to that step, everything later will be simple. So once you get that uh, 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 relieving load, you will look at the valve type itself, uh, fluid definition to know the whatever density is molecular weight or whatever it is and you will calculate the orifice size of the relief valve there is a standard orifice sizes provided by api which has a designation like a b c d whatever it is and each one of that uh, uh, orifice designation have a certain uh, area uh, in millimeter or in inch square uh, which you need to calculate based on the relieving rate and the conditions of your gas uh, and the pressure. The set pressure, or in this case, not the set pressure, it is a relieving pressure. So the more relieving rate, the more orifice area. The higher the pressure upstream the valve, the smaller the orifice required. Uh, this is all what I wanted to uh, tell you today. And uh, hopefully I uh, uh, explain it uh, uh, easily and you get the benefit from it. And uh, welcome to any questions uh, you need to clarify on any of these sections uh, explained today. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, it was very detailed and uh, I think uh, all the attendees uh, profited a lot from you sharing your uh, expertise and knowledge with us. Uh, Thank you. I'd like to uh, start sharing with you the questions we uh, started having. Uh, the first question is, what are the supercritical conditions and when do they occur? Meaning, uh, what situation causes uh, these conditions? Okay, if you look at, um, uh, if you draw the phase envelope for your uh, uh, fluid, the gas composition, uh, you have that phase envelope, if you remember the phase envelope. Uh, at a certain area uh, where you don't have liquid, you don't have gas, the properties of the super uh, critical conditions uh, will be very, uh, very different from liquid and from gas. So it is part of the your phase envelope. It is not gas, it is not liquid. It is just um, an area um, uh, I... Uh, I wish I could have the operating envelope to show you where this super critical uh, condition the, uh, should be on the phase envelope. But refer to the phase envelope, you will see where the super critical condition will be. Uh, okay, thank you for this uh, answer. Uh, another question we had, what is the mechanism of balanced safety valve that can tolerate 40% of the pressure? Yeah, the, that balanced safety valve will have what we call it a balanced bellows. That balanced bellows will be uh, having a, 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 a piece of equipment uh, like a pillow that has a vent uh, to avoid any accumulation of uh, the, the pressure and will maintain uh, the, the, the pressure beyond the disk to be uh, at a certain value. So it will not be more than a certain value. So whenever this happens, uh, that balanced below will maintain the pressure and uh, make sure that the back pressure will not increase. Uh, you can go to the references. Uh, I wish I have here the, the, the figure to show you the, the balanced below, but go to the internet and you can see the balanced below, how it is constructed and how it is different from the uh, uh, conventional type or spring loaded. Uh, 
Okay, another question we had. Uh, on what basis the sterile zone is defined? Okay, uh, as per the industry practice, the sterile zone is defined at uh, how much radiation intensity the uh, working force can withstand during uh, escape time. So, uh, um, they, as per the industry practice, the 3.6 uh, 3 kilowatt per, per square meter uh, degree C can be withstand in one minute. So, whenever it happens, the operator can escape from that place to out of that place. So, what we do normally, we identify where that sterile zone uh, shall be. So we build a fence around the flare uh, at the uh, contours or the perimeter of the 3.6. And we know, we, we, we tell the operator, whenever you have inside that, you have to wear a special uh, uh, protective equipment or clothes that can withstand the heat. He is not allowed to go outside of that unless you have, uh, he has a very uh, 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 limited uh, activity. And whenever uh, any release of, uh, or any relieving condition happen, he has to evacuate that area. Uh, there is higher uh, 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 radiation loads, uh, which is 4.6, but this 4.6 may be uh, 30 seconds or something like that, but normally, we built the defense around the 3.6 value. And uh, normally the operator inside the plant area can be exposed to 1.6 kilowatt per square meter degree C uh, all the shift time. Okay. Uh, another question and our last question is, uh, what is purge gas? Okay, what is Berge gas? Uh, as we explained, <clears throat> uh, the, the common flare header, the common flare stack, is sized for the emergency scenario or the most conservative, conservative relieving scenario. So it could be sized, for example, uh, one BCF, 1,000 million standard cubic feet per day. However, this is during emergency scenario. However, you operate normally uh, the flare system with few gases going through it. Could be one million, could be two million. That one million, two million is not enough to keep the air uh, from getting into the stack because the problem is if you have a, a, an elevated stack, the, the more the height you have, the more the negative pressure inside the vessel, you, uh, inside the stack you will get. So you need to make sure that you have enough gas going through the birch, uh, the, the flare stack, the flare header, which we call it birch gas, which is a uh, normal hydrocarbon from uh, like uh, fuel gas supply or whatever it is, that will be provided at the farthest end of the flare header and, and under the uh, stack uh, bottom to provide sufficient flow to avoid air ingress, to avoid flame flashback, uh, to avoid uh, 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 corrosion of the flare header itself. Because the problem is you will have due to uh, ambient condition condensation of uh, heavy stuff inside the, inside the flare header let's say uh, 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 hydrocarbon, uh, sorry, uh, vapor, uh, water vapor, this, uh, this condensed liquid, uh, which is water, will have a dissolved CO2 or H2S, so it's very corrosive. If it stays there at the flare header bottom, it will corrode the flare header, and you will have a, a loss of containment. So you need to have a minimum sweep gas velocity, as per the standard, should be 0.5 feet per second, velocity inside the flare header and get in, in order to get rid of this accumulated liquid 
with a proper slope. Engineer Ruay El Bakr, we thank you very much for uh, today's uh, presentation. It was very fruitful and uh, into depth. I believe everyone who attended today um, became an expert himself. <laughs> so we would like really to thank you and we appreciate um, your time and your effort today. And uh, we're looking forward for more presentations. Uh, and collaborations and we will probably have more questions coming along so if you don't mind we will send it your way and then we can share it with everyone. Sure, sure. Thanks Reem for uh, the introduction facilitation of the session. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, many thanks for Dr. Al-Garhi uh, uh, and the team for that uh, excellent effort. Uh, it was my pleasure today to be with you and uh, hopefully I transferred the knowledge and the uh, uh, decision was fruitful for all the participants. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doctor.